Welcome to Hope for Today, everyone. This is the PM service for May 16th. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to start with a song called Rock of Our Salvation. When I am shaken When I am lost You're always waiting Here at the cross Thank you, Lord. In every shadow rock of our salvation. Praise you, Lord. Keep us faithful. Keep us true, Lord. Keep us grounded in your word. We need you, Lord. And we praise you, Jesus. We give you all the glory today. Thank you for saving us. Jesus. 
Good evening. Welcome to Hope for Today Fellowship. So glad you could join us this evening. Uh, we had a great time of praise there with uh, Pastor Jenny and the, the rest of the crew. We're so excited to, uh, to be with you again this evening as we worship our God. What a, what a great joy. And uh, I want to remind you that Wednesday night Bible study is on, um, not in person, but on YouTube. So join us Wednesday night Bible studies with Pastor Colin, Brother John, and um, Narcotics Anonymous is still running Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So we spent, I don't know if you joined us this morning, I hope you did, but uh, if you missed it, um, we, uh, Wednesday we had a whole bunch of volunteers here. We, we stuffed 500 bags full of stuff that we're going to put in the doorknobs of uh, all the new homes in our subdivision across the street. So we're excited about that. We're not going to place them. We're not going to deliver them until the, um, the uh, lockdown is over because we don't want to embarrass people or put them in a bad situation or make them think that we don't respect the uh, laws of our, of our nation. So that's what we're doing. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your love. You're such a faithful God. Such a faithful God, always keeping your promises. Lord, you've never broke a promise to me, and I thank you for that. And I look forward to the future that we have together, you and I, and, and uh, eternal life. I know that, that, that you're, you're a faithful God, and you're going to keep your promises. So I, I, I am so confident in you that I have no fear. I have no fear. And that's such a beautiful thing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. When I look around at our community... And I see all the fear that people have. Oh God, I cry for them. How terrible to go through life with fear. Fear is Satan's tool. But peace is from God. And so I pray, Lord, that we can reach the people of our community with the good news about Jesus Christ. And that they would find peace. That they would find comfort in these trying times. Thank you so much. Father, be with our, our brothers and sisters down in Waterford at Hope for Today Fellowship Waterford. I uh, pray for Pastor Andrew, Lord. Give him wisdom as he continues to work on setting this thing up and getting it ready to kick off the first week of June. We thank you so much for your goodness. You're such a great God. We look so forward to seeing what you have for us in the next year. Even in the next week, we're so excited. Father, we pray for our government, uh, both federal, provincial, and local. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, give them wisdom through the power of your Holy Spirit to make the right decisions, make the right choices. Lord, and most of all, we, we pray that they would choose you, that they would learn to follow the God of the world, the God of the universe. We thank you so much. Father, I pray for all of those in our fellowship that are hurting because of physical, uh, uh, physical problems, uh, diseases, uh, sores, whatever it is they have, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray that you'd heal them, give them comfort, give them peace. Thank you so much, Lord. For all those that are suffering financially in our fellowship and in our community, oh God, we pray that somehow um, things would work out. I mean, we know that things will work out. We just need to put our trust and our faith and our hope in you. Oh Lord, and I pray that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we'd reach out to each other and make sure that we're all okay and that we'd be taking care of one another, especially as we go through times like this. Thank you so much for your, for your Holy Spirit that teaches us. As we look into your word, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. So, uh, we're continuing on 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 to 16. False teachers. This morning we talked about, we talked about the judgment that's coming, the condemnation that's coming upon false teachers, heretics, with the condemnation that's coming upon those who follow them, who choose to follow them. And, and Peter is constantly warning us about false teachers and about following false, false stories, cleverly devised myths. <laughs> really, Peter says, we don't follow those. Why are you? And so we want to look into this, um, into this. again, he's warning us, again, again. Man, it's got to be big. This is really on Peter's heart. It must have been a big thing, even in their church at, at this time. Uh, he, and he's writing as though, like, I, when I read it, I think, man, he's talking to us today because we got such a big problem with false teachers. And yet, he was having the same problem, even way back then. 
2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 to 16. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So he's talking about the false teachers, about their condemnation. I mean, he's talking about condemnation for everyone who's following false uh, teachings. And then he says, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Behold, oh, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. You get paid for wrongdoing. And your wage is suffering. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They count it pleasure to get away with sin. Right in front of everybody in the daylight. They are blots and blemishes. Reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They're never satisfied. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. They are cursed children. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. He was rebuked for his own sin. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. You, you got to read that story. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but, but you got to read that story, man. That's hilarious. God, God takes the guy's donkey, and the donkey speaks to him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It's not a joke. It's serious. God did that. And, and, man, if you don't listen when your donkey talks to you, who are you going to listen to? But Peter didn't play around when he warned us against false teachers. Man, he talked to us so much about false teachers and about those who choose to follow them. He used some of the most extreme language of the New Testament to denounce these heretics, these false teachers, and their heretical teachings. He spoke very pointedly. He spoke very pointedly about the effect that false teaching would have on people. He didn't mess around. This, this is a serious matter and it's huge. He warned of the disillusionment and defeat that would follow those who believed, those who took in, those who bought in to such false teaching. If a person believes wrong, he or she will live wrong. That's important to remember. If you believe something that's a lie, you will live that way. It, it, it controls the way you live. Here, Peter deals with the consequences of listening to false teachers. If you listen to them, you will eventually embrace their teaching. You, you can tell me, well, I listen to Joyce Meyer and, and some of the things she says is good. Yeah, and that's how she cons you. That's how she cons you. That's how they all do it. They, they, they say some things that are good. They sing some songs that are really nice songs. And then you start listening to them. And the more you listen to them, there's going to be something that they say that you're not sure of, and you'll buy right in. Oh, that must be one of those good things that she says. When you embrace their teaching, your life will follow. Notice the consequences of heresy, of wrong teaching, as it's seen in the lifestyle of these false teachers. Look at the consequences. Oh yeah, but I want a jet. I, I want to drive a Ferrari. Oh, okay, well if those are the consequences that you want, you go ahead. You go ahead. Follow them. And, and live the lifestyle they're living. We talked about that this morning. Judgment's coming. It's not idle. It's coming. Yeah, they're, they're enjoying their lifestyle right now, but for eternity, they're not going to. Think about it. 
Take a look at what Peter says about the characteristics of these false teachers and those who embrace their false teachings. Number one, they are disobedient. They don't listen to authority. 2 Peter 2.10, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they're presumptuous. They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. They can make fun of God all they want. They can tell you things about God that aren't true. Doesn't bother them one bit. They don't tremble. They're so bold and so willful, so arrogant, that they don't tremble when they say something that's not true. You can't tell. You can't tell. Can you imagine if, if, if when, if when a, a false teacher is teaching, he's teaching, he's teaching from the Word of God, and he's teaching something good, he's teaching something good, and then he gets to a part where he's going to twist it, purposely twist it, to con you. Can you imagine if he got there and he's... And he started breaking out in his sweat, and he had trouble doing it because of his conscience. It'd be easy to pick up on, wouldn't it? But they don't do that. They don't even tremble. Joyce Meyer doesn't tremble when she says that Jesus didn't save you from your sins when he died on the cross. He didn't. He saved you from your sins when he descended into hell. She doesn't tremble when she says that. She says it with a straight face. No trembling. It's a lie from hell. The Bible says Jesus took away our sin by dying on the cross, not by going to hell. She says he took our place in hell. No, no. He didn't take our place in hell. He made it so we don't have to go to hell by dying in our place. It's our death. The wages of sin is death. It's not the wages of sin is hell. But she doesn't tremble. They don't tremble. I'm not just picking on Joyce Meyer. Sorry. I'm not picking on Joyce Meyer. But I'm letting you know. She sounds good. I've listened to her sermons. She sounds good. She does it well. She does it well. And then she just slips in these little things. Slips them in. They're disobedient. Number two. The next thing we should notice is that these heretics, these false teachers, they indulge in the lust of defiling passion. They're driven by depravity, by their sinful nature. They're not walking in the spirit, they're walking in the flesh. Paul the Apostle said this in Galatians 5.16. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you won't give in to the flesh. Remember that these are false teachers. They deny that Jesus is God. They deny the inspiration and authority of the Bible and many other precious teachings of the Word of God. They deny them. These false teachers are lost. They're lost. They do not have the Spirit of God. Oh, but they sound like it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. He they sound like, they oh, they sound so much like they're born again. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not doing what comes natural to them. Oh, actually, they are doing what comes natural to them. Because what comes naturally to us is sin. Our fleshly desires. They're doing what comes naturally to them. They're walking in the flesh. Number three, the third characteristic of false teachers. Peter says that the false teachers and their followers are presumptuous. They're bold and willful. This word comes from Ptolemites. It's used only here in the New Testament. It's the only place that that's used. Shamelessly bold and arrogant, willful and bold. This is the second part of the passage in, in verse 10. It says, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. They're bold and willful. They're bold and willful. They're so arrogant, in fact, that they don't even tremble. They don't even tremble when they blaspheme the glorious ones. So brazen are these false teachers that they defy God. 
And they exalt themselves. It's common today to see preachers and teachers who set themselves up as God. In fact, a lot of the guys on TV are into this little gods thing. We're little gods. God has made us just a little bit littler than him. We're little gods. We're not, just, we're not just made in his image. We're little gods. Look it up. They say that. Third John, verse 9. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Diotrephes was driven by the flesh. He was motivated by pride. Jesus Christ alone is to have preeminence. He's to be first in our life. Nobody else. This guy set himself up. Because of his pride, he, he, he refused to listen to authority. I've had people do that to me, man. I spent time in, in West Africa. I went with a, with a gentleman who was a pastor. This guy almost wanted me to kneel at his feet. He was so arrogant, so willfully bold. It was awful. We, we went to mark homework papers. That's what we were there for, setting up a Bible college. And we're marking homework papers. He refused. He refused to do the, the work because he was somehow special. He was willfully, he was bold and willful. He, he refused authority. Unbelievable. But this is how people operate. They set themselves up to be first. I'm the best. I don't need authority. God is determined, as we can see in Colossians 1.18, that Jesus is preeminent. He is to be first. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. He might be first. God says he is to be first. A person who walks in the Spirit will say with John the Baptist, as John 3.30, <laughs> John 3, he must increase. Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. I must decrease. Jesus has to be first. The fourth thing that Peter points out to us, these guys are self-willed. The word self-willed comes from the Greek word doesn't matter because no one wants to remember a Greek word anyway, but it carries the, the meaning, the idea of self-pleasing, self-centeredness. Look at 2 Peter 2, 12 to 14. Very strange passage. Sometimes you read it and you wonder. But these, like irrational animals, see, animals don't think. I don't know if you know that. They don't. They, they work by instinct. Creatures of instinct, see? Born to be caught and destroyed. They're born to be caught and killed so that we can eat them. Blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. That's how, these, that's how these false teachers, they're acting like animals who are working by instinct rather than being rational. They're blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. They don't even know what they're talking about. And they'll also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong for the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deception while they feast with you. You're sitting there, everything's cool, and you're hanging out, and you, you don't even know. They have eyes full of adultery. They're never satisfied with sin. They've got to have more and more. They entice unsteady souls. They're looking for people who don't read the Word of God, who don't study the Word of God. They're looking for those people so they can entice them away from the Lord. They have hearts that are trained in greed. That's what they're, they're, they're greedy people. They're accursed children. These people live for themselves. They don't live for anybody else. They live for themselves. They do what pleases them. They're abstinent and they're stubborn. They refuse to listen to reason. They are self... They're set on doing what they want and nothing is going to stop them. They don't care what you want. They don't care what the Lord wants. They're doing their thing. When we see that phrase, they speak evil... Speak evil. It, it comes from the word blasphemo, from which we get our word blasphemy. 
It, it carries the idea of slander and false teachers, and, and those who follow them have no respect for God. They have no respect for God-ordained authority. God has set up authority. He is a God of order. As a result of the prideful and stubbornly living for themselves, they arrogantly refuse to recognize God's ordained authority. God himself is the ultimate authority. The Bible says so. God has given authority to parents and to government and to pastors. It's all in the Bible. Our God is a God of order. And order says that we must have authority. All these people who say, get rid of the police, they're ridiculous. They're being ridiculous. What's next? Get rid of the police. Get rid of the government. Total anarchy. What a great idea. Our God is a God of order. Number five, the, these teachers... Dare to do even that which the highest of God's messengers, the highest of God's angels, would not even do. 2 Peter 2.11 Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. What a contrast. When we listen to Jude speaking in the same context, he gives us an example. Check this out. Jude 10. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Jude says the same thing that Peter says. Jude 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. These false teachers do that which is even the highest of the angels. The archangel Michael would not do. Even Michael himself would not rebuke the devil. The Bible doesn't say anywhere to rebuke. Hey, if you've been following these teachers who tell you you need to rebuke the devil, you need to pray at the devil, you need to talk to him and tell him to get out of here. If you're listening to those people, stop it. Even the highest of God's angels didn't rebuke the devil. He said, not me rebuke you, but the Lord rebuke you. We don't need to talk to the devil. Stop it. But these false teachers do that which even the highest angel would not do. Even Michael himself would not rebuke the devil. Michael ranks first in God's creative order of angels. He is the number one. He's the archangel. There's no one higher than Michael except God. You know what Michael's name means? He who is of God. He who is as God. That's a very high name, isn't it? Michael. As he, carries, as he was carrying out God's orders, the devil showed up and the devil began to argue with him. Michael acting under the direct authority of God. Michael was diligent about carrying out God's orders. Satan gets in the way and Michael says, I'm not going to waste my time with you. The Lord will rebuke you. Our authority to contend for the faith is a delegated authority and we must rely upon God who delegates that authority to us. We rely upon God, not us. Number six, these false teachers are compared to irrational beasts. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Peter illustrates the nature of false teachers by comparing them to animals who have no reason. There's no rationale. They're, they're driven by instinct rather, rather than understanding. Animals, animals don't think it over. You, your dog, you know, you throw the frisbee, and the dog doesn't sit there and go, hmm, if I go after that Frisbee, I'm going to get tired and probably hungry. They're not sitting there trying to rationalize. By instinct, they chase it, just like they chase a car, like they chase a kid on a bicycle. They just chase things. That's their instinct. Instinct. 
Peter illustrates the nature of these false teachers by comparing them to these animals that have no reason. Like animals, these false teachers are slaves to their instinct. Their nature is to peddle false teachings. Their instinct is to go with their flesh. Their instinct is greed. False teachers have no concern for the judgment to come. They're just like the animals. Animals don't think about what's going what's to happen if, if I'm chasing this car. Uh, what's going to happen when he slams on his brakes? Maybe I shouldn't chase this car. Dogs don't think about that. They wait until their brains hit the bumper. Even then they're like, <laughs> they're all happy. They're working by instinct. Peter says these beasts, these animals, they're born... They're born for destruction. On the day of slaughter, when it's a day for that animal to be slaughtered, he still goes on eating. He still goes on sleeping. He still goes on drinking and playing. He does all the things that he normally does by instinct because he has no idea that today is the day he's going to die. Today is the day. And that's how false teachers are. They go on gathering as much money as they can, teaching as many lies as they can, without even thought that today could be the day of judgment. Their destruction. They're living for the flesh. John 5.5 5 says, You've lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. On the day of slaughter, you're still fattening your heart. No thought of judgment. These false teachers speak evil of the things that they don't understand. Well, why don't they understand them? As some of them have been to Bible culture. Not many of them. Not many of them. But some of them have. Why don't they understand? Why can't they open up the Bible and read it and understand? 1 Corinthians tells us that those without the Holy Spirit, they're perishing. Those who are perishing don't understand. It's all foolishness to those who are perishing. It's all foolishness to those who don't have the Spirit of God. You can't read the Bible without the Spirit of God teaching you. It's, he's the teacher. He's the teacher. And none of these guys, none of these false teachers have the Spirit of God living in them. They don't. Or they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. So they don't understand. They have no understanding. That's what that's talking about. Romans 8, 7 to 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It cannot. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you don't submit to God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We have to be walking in the Spirit of God. Or else we're opposed to the things of God and will not understand. No matter how much education a man has, the Bible is a closed book to him, apart from the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Number seven, false teachers will not escape the wrath of God. Number six, <laughs> I got the wrong number. Number six, I did six. Oh, I put it wrong on the slide. Sorry about that. I've been corrected. So number six or seven, false teachers will not escape the wrath of God. False teachers, they go on as a natural brute beast, destroying and, and defaming the truth of God's word. But the day of judgment is coming. God is coming. And like a lamb, like an animal in the day of slaughter, apostates will be dealt with finally and fully. Don't worry about them. They'll get theirs. God is faithful. Number seven or eight. These false teachers are immoral. They're immoral. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable to sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. They're accursed children. Never have we seen a time when so many religious teachers are falling into sexual sin. Pastors and, and leaders, they're falling into a sexual sin like, like never before. 
They have eyes full of adultery. It indicates that these false teachers can't even look at women without seeing her as an object of sex. Eyes are full of adultery. This reminds us of Christ's words in Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The heart is where the adultery starts. The eyes are just the gateway to the heart. They're so entangled that they cannot cease from sin. They're slaves to sin. They're slaves to their desires, their wicked desires. They just can't stop. They're powerless to overcome. They go on enticing unsteady and unstable souls. They're looking for those who are easy to lure. And they're hiding under this cloak of religion. Easily led astray. Number eight or nine. Eight. These false teachers are in for it, and they can't get out of it. They're in it for what they can get out of it. Boy, I read that wrong. These false teachers are in it for what they can get out of it. 2 Peter 2, 15 to 16. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Baal-aam, the son of Beor, and they've loved gain from wrongdoing, but, but was rebuked for his own transgression, his own sin. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice. There is interest in not helping people. That's what they're into. They, they don't want to help people. They're in it for personal gain. That's what it's all about. And Peter illustrates this by the, by the story of Balaam. So this guy, this prophet, he gets hired by, by, the, by the enemies of Israel, to go and curse Israel so that they'll win the war. And, and, and Balaam's going to do it because he's going to make money. And so he goes to curse, but he can't curse Israel because the, don and the donkey says to him, you can't do that, man, that's not right. And, and, and he tries to curse Israel, but the, the curse is reversed and it curses, it curses the other army. The king of Moab and his people, they are cursed. So, so Balaam says to, uh, to the Midianites, he says, he says, why don't you lure the Israelites into Baal worship, the god of the, the Moabs, Moabites? And, and, and so, and so they, they tried to lure him. The men of Israel fell for it. That's the sad part. There's the people of God, just like us, people of God. And everything's going in their favor. But then they get lured into the worship of a foreign god. Look what it says. The, the men of Israel fell for it, and 24,000 of them, 24,000 of them died under God's judgment. Balaam was driven by a desire for personal gain. And prophet, pulpits are full of people like that today. I mean, we're just, false teachers are out there for all they can get. They're not interested in helping God. They're not interested in helping people. They want to help themselves. They're not real shepherds. If they were, they would preach the word of God regardless of the consequences. And they would teach the whole word of God, the whole counsel of the word. And they would teach it the way it's supposed to be taught as the apostles taught us. But they're not doing that. They're not doing that because they're in it for personal gain. They don't care if people come to know the Lord. This is, this is what John speaks of in John 10, 12 to 13. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolves coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. When we lived in Kenya, we used to have security guards. My dad was building a college for, uh, for uh, Kenyan nationals. And, and so while it was being built, we had to leave security guards there so that the materials didn't go disappearing. And so we'd hire a, a bunch of, there was like four security guards. But in the morning, my dad would go to the, to the site and the security guards were gone. And dad would say, what happened? They say, well, some bad people came and they all took off. They don't care. The days that they were there, they got paid for. They're not going to risk their lives 
for something that doesn't belong to them. They're not going to be careful to take care of the things that don't belong to them because they're just a hired hand. Some of these people professing to be pastors, shepherds, they don't care about the sheep. They're not true shepherds. Their true love is money. They stay until things get rough and then they'll take off. As a pastor, as a shepherd, I've seen many people from Hope for Today Fellowship leave. They've been enticed. They've been enticed out of here. And they've gone somewhere else where false teaching has tickled their ear. It's sad. It's sad. We've got to realize the end is coming. Jesus is coming back soon. We need to be careful that we don't get enticed away from being loyal to Jesus Christ. we got to be careful. John talks about the anointing that we have. We all have the anointing. People misuse that word. But but we all have the anointing of God, and that's the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment. Helps us to know what's good and what's bad. Go with what's good, stay away from what's evil. But that, that discernment also comes through reading the Word of God with the Holy Spirit's help. We need to read the Word of God. We will be deceived if we are unstable, if we're weak in our faith, if we're not growing. We will be deceived. And there's going to be more false teachers than you've ever seen before. As closer we get to the end, the more false teachers are going to arise. People, please, get in the Word. Just just read one chapter a day. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Grow. Grow. Grow in Christ and you'll be safe. We won't fall. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. And we thank you for this teaching. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit and the gift of the Word of God. Oh, God, would we be lost. But you've given us everything we need, everything that pertains to a life of godliness, a life of holiness. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Help us all to desire to read your word. Give us a hunger for the word of God. Help us, Lord, to be discerning. To make sure that what we listen to and what we watch and what we do in our lives won't lead us away from you, but will lead us closer to you. Thank you for this, Lord. We give you all the praise, the glory, the honor. Oh, God. There's none like you. Praise and honor belong to you. It's yours. It's yours. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions or concerns about anything we said this morning, please feel free to email me, bvonhopefortoday.ca. Love to chat with you. Okay, God bless. Have a great day. Bye for now.